Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you uh, for joining us for this evening's talk. We'll just wait for everyone to... Tfadari. Uh, we're very happy to uh, welcome, well, we're going to start with the lady on my right, uh, Sumeya. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. Abdul Aziz, uh, sorry, Abdur, Abdurrahman Gazaz. It's a bad start. Uh, Turkey, Gazaz. Um, so today we're going to talk about a couple of subjects. We're going to run about 45 minutes or so. I will uh, start by giving a little intro on Sumeya. She's one of the curators of the Islamic Arts Benali, and uh, she's also an award-winning architect and designer. Abdurrahman and Turki Gazaz are the founders of Brick Lab. Brick Lab is, a dedicated, is dedicated to the examination of the design discipline as it intersects with the social, political, economic, and cultural networks that form our built environment. One of the recent projects, Saudi Modern, which we'll be getting into today, documents and raises awareness about modern Saudi architecture. Their installation here encourages the reflection on such a building used to accommodate Hajis in Jeddah. Um, just before we really kick off this panel, I, uh, I want to thank the Dir'iya Ben Ali Foundation. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram. It's uh, under Ben Ali. If you put in B-I-E, the, the rest uh, should, should come up. So I just want to thank them for arranging for this evening's talk. Okay. You guys ready? You look nervous. Nervous? Sure? Abdurrahman? I'm going to get your name right going, going forward. Can we start again? Saudi Modern. Modernization in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Modern is a conversation between the founders of Brick Lab, Abdurrahman in Turkey, and Sumeya. I'm going to start with you, Abdurrahman. Can you tell us, in a nutshell, what Brick Lab does on the ground? And on top of that, have you taken any interest in modern Saudi architecture? Um. At Brick Lab, we are primarily architects, but we have uh, very different interests. To us, architecture is a very malleable subject, so um, we indulge in the arts, as we did with Sumeya. Thank you, Sumeya. Um, and we work on publications, and up, up until recently, we have found ourselves heavily researching um, modern architecture in Jeddah as a reaction to the different requests for proposals for projects and kind of questioning what is the identity of Jeddah. Um, for, for a very long time, we haven't grown up in Jeddah. We, for us, the identity of Jeddah is not just Al-Balad, but it's the extension of Al-Balad. It's um, the urban expansion of Jeddah and everything that it encapsulates um, without any bias. Uh, it's, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly are all part of this archival process that we've started doing through this initiative that we call Saudi Modern. Saudi Modern um, uh, is a series of architectural, or kind of an intersection of architecture and artistic expressions um, that take place in um, abandoned houses that we revamp as, um, as a notion to reuse buildings and upcycle architecture. Um, and it also documents uh, modernity. So the first um, issue of Saudi Modern took place last year in uh, Beit Tamur, in Sharafiya, just at the edge of Al Balad, outside of what is kind of um, officially called Al Balad. Um, so it's just outside the periphery. We documented uh, different bits of architecture, and then I think over time, we looked at Jeddah between the 30s and the 60s, um, and I think one of the buildings that we focused on was this building, um, uh, the Air Pilgrims Accommodation, Mabna Hujjaj al Jo, which sits uh, right next to the old airport, which is commonly known as Matar Abbas bin Farnas um, in south of Jeddah. So for us, it really 
kind of it was an expansion of of our practice in BrickLab and an extension of uh, Saudi modern that made its way into the Bain Ali through many many conversations we had with Sumia. Um, here we're in the Hajj terminal, uh, which is the newer addition. So after Matar Abbas bin Firnas, there was this airport in 1981 that was built uh, along uh, with, uh, with the SOM um, tented structures to get uh, the pilgrims um, to kind of travel, arrive here and go to, to Mecca uh, and perform Hajj or Umrah or what have you. Um, so it seemed befitting to talk about Jeddah from that kind of architectural perspective within um, kind of the, the wider context of an Islamic Biennale. I think that's overrun the answer for this question. No, no, thank you so much. It was very informative. Just to double check, this building still stands today. It's being demolished as we speak. As we sp I wish I didn't ask. Um, <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, Sumeya. How do you feel that architecture plays an important role in reflecting the identity of the place we call home? What kind of role does architecture have you know, in defining home for us, would you say? Um, thank you so much for the question. It's such an honor to be here uh, with the team at the Diriya Biennale Foundation and with Abdurrahman in Turkey. And I've just been reflecting, listening to Abdurrahman, how much at home I feel in Jeddah and how much also I've been welcomed home in the city. So thank you so much also to everyone in our audience, all my friends in Jeddah reflected here as well. Um, I think architecture has a profound role to play in the construction of our belonging. It's something that we take for granted because all of us are born into architecture. But as we grow up, architecture becomes part of shaping our identities. We are in dialogue with our environment and it reflects who we are to us. So the environments that we grow up in really have a central role to play in forming our identities, in affirming our place in the world and in affirming our sense of belonging. I grew up in South Africa and um, I was born in 1990 when apartheid was at its end. But of course, um, architecture is a very slow old game and segregation, the segregation in South Africa is still incredibly rife. And I think <clears throat> perhaps more than most cities in South Africa, we have profound examples of how architecture really affirms a social structure and affirms a hierarchy in how it really kind of elevates some people and um, you know, al allows other people to fall to the margins. And because of that, I think I've always had this awareness about the power of architecture in our lives. Reflecting on this structure that we're all in now, I think when I first visited the site professionally, I was also flooded with memories of being here as a pilgrim and as a haji, of seeing, uh, I was 14 years old when I performed Hajj for the first time, and when I came to the site, I remember just being flooded with these memories of seeing people come together, of hearing accents and languages from around the world, of seeing food from around the world, seeing people leading each other in prayer, hearing different pronunciations, and this profound understanding that this is a place where the entire world comes together, where Muslims from the entire world feel a sense of belonging and a sense of home. And that's something certainly reflected in Abdurrahman and Turkey's installation so beautifully, but something I think that this region um, has always had a history of being a place of welcome and being a place of gathering for the entire ummah. Beautifully said. You actually have memories of, of being here at the age of 14, huh? Well, that's, uh, it's amazing for it to all come full circle, uh, whereby now it's, you know, part of the terminal is, uh, is the Benali. That's, uh, it's amazing. Going back to, I want to hear from Turkey. We, you know, we spoke about the, uh, the building that, well, we were just informed what's going to happen to it. As far as future projects um, with regards to Saudi modern, what can you tell us uh, of what's to come in the pipeline going forward? Uh, so currently, I mean, we've uh, just deinstalled the exhibition in uh, Tamar House, and we've also started to engage with uh, 
One of the participants, actually, at the Biennale, uh, seen architect Nujud Sederi and Sara Al Isa, um, <coughs> uh, to work on uh, an edition for uh, Riyadh, and they're taking a specific angle uh, about uh, about <coughs> urbanism in Riyadh and the development that was happening, uh, but uh, in. Uh, uh, right in, at the center of uh, the city, so it's more related to uh, a geographic location than a, a timeline. Um, and in parallel, we're also uh, developing the next uh, edition of Saudi Modern in Jeddah, where we are really looking at, in the first edition, we looked at you know the urban expansion. We documented this, a number of buildings. Um, and in the next one, we're really looking at building materials and looking at uh, the developments that were happening in the construction industry and seeing how those have started to develop uh, a certain architectural language. And just um, a few days ago, I mean, uh, uh, Abdurrahman and I were passing uh, through Shar uh, al Kayal, and we started noticing that really it's a lot of these construction materials that really become uh, very fashionable, uh, trendy um, every few years. and. You see the buildings really literally removing the old facade and adding a new one. And we're seeing this new kind of typology starting to emerge. And I think that uh, what's interesting is that sometimes you look at the modern buildings in uh, areas, mostly in the south of Jeddah and Baghdadiyah and Sharafiya, and the facade of the building would be this you know, really expensive travertine tiles, uh, stone, um, and then someone comes in and covers them with a uh, aluminum cladding because that's sort of the you know this is what's trending now. So I think that uh, for so for the next edition we're really looking at uh, parallel developments in terms of um, the construction industry, uh, the labor uh, workforce that has started to flood into Saudi, especially in that early period, which has which has really quickly developed to become uh, a a very important part of our society. Um, and also uh, looking at the industrial facilities that uh, have started to come uh, pop up, uh, especially during that time, to see how these have started to support um, the general development, um, let's say an architect without architects. Speaking of uh, industrial, you just reminded me of a material that I've noticed to become very popular with people building retail or apartments or houses, which is concrete flooring. This hypoxy has becoming very popular. Have you noticed it in your line of work? Yeah, I mean, Question for either of you. I remember when we worked um, on Med Cafe in 2014, we wanted concrete floor and the, the contractors were freaking out. Like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> So it was really hard. It took them a while to understand how to develop this material, but you really see it, it quickly caught on, and now it's everywhere. Yeah. So, or God forbid, the ducting of the AC showing, which is now part of the trend, right? You just want to leave that all bare with the fire hoses and the AC, and it's just it's so much has changed, actually, as far as interior spaces are concerned. Uh, two questions, and I'm going to stay with you guys. Um, with regards to general interest in architecture locally, uh, how has that changed in the last five years or so? Has there been more interest? That's the first part of the question. And second one is, what is the general reaction to your work by the populace who come to, whether it's the Tamar Gallery or, or anything else that you work on? Like, what, what are people's reaction to your work? I think one major uh, shift that we've uh, noticed is that, um, is that Architecture up until, I mean, the past five, seven years uh, has always been really uh, considered as part of the engineering, um, engineering disciplines. And I remember, I mean, when, when I first graduated and I started working, um, really the discussion of architecture beyond the practicalities and the functionality of construction and program was really limited. Um, I mean, I was lucky to work with Dr. Hazem Sobah, who happens to be here, and uh, and it really felt like he was really carving out a space for architects to speak about architecture as a cultural discourse and speak about how it relates to our uh, sense of being, our sense of belonging, and how that is a very important 
that's just as important as actually making the building stand. Um, and <clears throat> and I think that and uh, one of the um, and I think there was the discussion was very limited and it was very limited to uh, you know professionals in architecture and it was more about building technology, construction materials and engineering. Um, and I see that over the past five years, finally architecture has become part of the the, cult, the language of culture and uh, how that relates to um, <coughs> our identity. And um, I remember in 2015, um, Abdurrahman started a series of uh, talks uh, because there was literally no space for dialogue. There was no space for um, speaking about architecture within in that language. And I think you could talk about a bit about uh, the talks. Um, I think. It's not that uh, nothing was happening. It was mostly that people would talk about one specific project, kind of like TED Talks in a way. Um, and we just noticed that over time, um, I mean, we, we kind of would like to hear what people have to say um, about what they think, if, if you're established enough, how, what is your take on, uh, let's say, relevance of craftsmanship, the spirit of the place, all of these things. And we get different people from different professions. And for us, it was that was, kind of the catalyst to br bring people together. Um, and I think again and again, we see this very encouraging factor where we are, we keep getting invited to work on things like this. We, uh, I mean, with Saudi Modern, we got the support of the Ministry of Culture, Zahid Group, Gauthier Institute, uh, Tamr Group, and a bunch of others. Um, and it was, it, it just keeps fueling this. Again, going back to Saudi Modern, it's all of these thoughts and ideas that you've worked on has been deeply kind of rooted in our approach. I mean, we've collected um, uh, archival material from artists, we've produced models with students, and we've also uh, gotten, um, gotten a hold of the early master plans of Jeddah, and we're able to showcase that. The reaction to Saudi Modern, we were meant to open for, what, 20 days? Um, and we ended up being asked to extend it for two months asked to extend it for another four months, so the exhibition was open for six months, which is quite incredible, alhamdulillah. Um, and I think it's just, it's just that kind of ripple effect, and then we meet Sumeya, and she's like, yeah, I'm interested in this. How can we keep this conversation alive? And it was so refreshing to be um, involved in, in an exhibition that talks about um, Islam from a very contemporary perspective, and I think I'd, I'd like to hear what Sumeya uh, would have to say about this, and then to also kind of absorb this idea, okay, let's, let's take a slice of this building that exists now that used to be the predecessor of where the exhibition is. So it's kind of tracing the entirety of Jeddah and bringing it back to the Hajj terminal. And I think that's a very interesting dialogue. Um, I think even in terms of reactions, I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to yeah. say. So may I let you <laughs> chime in on that yeah. actually, and then I'm gonna follow up with a question. So give her the mic. Um. Yeah, I think this, thank you so much, Abdurrahman, for this prompt. Um, it's been very important through the process of this Biennale uh, that we put forth a different definition to what Islamic art is. And I was particularly interested in finding a definition that is resonant with our lives, with our rituals, with our forms of Islamic living and culture, and of course, our rituals of spirituality. And as you know, the exhibition unfolds in two themes, Qibla and Hijra, where Qibla is really thinking about our internal forms of spirituality, the symbolic gathering that we have around the Kaaba every time we stand up in prayer that we're connected with Muslims, past, present, and future, who do the same. And the theme of Hijra, under which Abdurrahman and Turkey's installation falls, is really thinking about this place, Jeddah, as a nexus for cultural production by virtue of the fact that so many people have gathered here over millennia. And it's also thinking about all of the ways that we construct home and construct belonging, no matter where we are in the world. So our forms of communing, our forms of gathering around food, around religious holidays and festivals, um, through Hajj and Umrah, uh, forms of work, forms of worship. We're really thinking about the ingredients and infrastructures for coming together, which is such a big part of the life of being a Muslim. And in this installation in particular, um, 
it's, it's really profound that just by virtue of the fact that so many people came together in the same place, this place became a place that engineered so much cultural production. Um, people like Malcolm X spent time in the Air Pilgrim's accommodation, and you know he also wrote postcards from it about the profound effect that being with others uh, from around the world had on him. And um, I think it's also really interesting in Brick Lab's practice more broadly that they're interested in granular histories and beyond thinking about um, fast forward to the future or the very uh, kind of old image that we have of history, if we think about, um, you know, history uh, in this region has, I think, also been colonized in a way where we have certain tropes and images of what that looks like. They're reflecting on the modernist period as an important part of history that's perhaps being overlooked, but that has played a central role in the formation of culture in this region. And um, the installation for me is really an archive of so many stories that have taken place in this building. We're working at the moment on an aspect for the public program where the installation becomes active. We're working with traders across Jeddah to also bring this installation to life. And it's really profound in Brick Lab's practice that they think about history as something that's active and present, and the archive as something that's generative for the present and the future. Uh, Abdurrahman, that's the building you referred to in the beginning, correct? Yes. The one that's... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and any idea when this picture was taken? Modern day, correct? The middle, yeah. middle picture? Yeah, yeah, the middle, these are pictures that we have actually taken when superimposed with historical pictures. Okay. So I think that resonates, your question resonates with what Sumaya just said, is that how do we actively portray that? Um, these images were generated actually by um, uh, Ghaida Qutub. She's uh, part of the Brick Lab Collective. She worked on the video, so I invite you all to have a look at the video. Um, <coughs> and I think for us, just to kind of give a further explanation, what we did is we simply took a slice of the building um, and we built it one-to-one -one and housed it with this archival material. Uh, so hopefully after this talk, we can go have a walk about um, and see our installation up against the other installations, which I think are quite also very interesting. I mean, we have studio bound here. Their work is really interesting. Uh, we're very lucky to be uh, next to them, next to Dima Sruji's work, uh, Noor al-Sayeh. All of these are the art architects and artists have a very um, interesting approach towards this particular topic. And I think what was kind of curatorially done in a really smart way is that they're all in a very kind of constant dialogue with each other. Um, I wouldn't be doing a very good job if I didn't ask the question that's on many people's minds. And that question is why the demolition? <laughs> I mean, it's a, quite a controversial answer, but it's just... Is it? Is it due to the, what was built legally and illegally? No, no, it was, okay. it was, it was an official building. It was, it was built in tandem with the Abbas Ben Fernas Airport, but it's just, sadly, it's just not deemed historic enough, I think. I think there's also a shift in the fact that before people used to come for Hajj and Umrah and spend some time in Jeddah before going to Mecca, and that's with the pace and the way that things are shifting now. I think that's less and less present. So people come to Jeddah and then drive to Makkah or take the train to Makkah almost immediately. So we're spending less time in Jeddah. And uh, I think we can all say that we really believe it's uh, important to retain the heritage of this place as a place of welcome. So many families from Jeddah have in their DNA uh, families from around the world because of the fact that this has always been a place of welcome. And the, this work in particular, I think, goes a long way to honor that. I hope that projects like the Biennale also reinstate this as a very important part of um, the, the region and a, part, a, a very important part of the pilgrimage, this Jeddah as the gateway. Uh, staying with you, with the installations that we see around us, I know trying to capture the public's interest is very important. On the subject of the public, what do you feel that you want the public to gain most out of from all the beautiful installations you see at the Benali? Um, 
Well, as I said, it's been really important that this is a definition of Islamic art that's resonant with our lives. And I hope that people feel that this definition has manifested something of our identities, that it's something that we can be proud of, that there's so much to learn and gain from thinking deeply about the philosophies and the heritages that we come from. And for me, this Biennale has also been an incredible learning experience of the culture of Jeddah. And I keep mentioning this, this place of eternal welcome. Um, I have grown so much in my understanding of the Hejaz as an incre incredibly complex place, one that has integrated culture from around the world and one that has also transmitted its culture to the world. And I hope that that's something that people also gain and learn from this experience. Thank you. Um, for you guys, before we're going to open the question to the floor in a, in a couple of minutes' time, um, but just before we do, um, how do you think that your installation can bring to life, uh, and what do you say captures the public's imagination when it comes to your installation? What what is an integral part of your installations that? that really generates interest of the public? I mean, I think that the, uh, <clears throat> its uh, location, obviously, under the, uh, the Hajj terminal, uh, really reflects on the wider lineage or the wider narrative of Hajj infrastructure. And it also uh, allows the public to sort of reflect on the different attitudes that, um, the, the different roles Jeddah has played over history. So, I, f so in the, <clears throat> beginning of the 20th century, uh, Hajis would arrive by boat and they would stay in people's homes. And that had a completely different impact on the interface between the pilgrim and the urban fabric of the city and its uh, communities. Um, so, and the building that we are, <coughs> we're examining here, the Air Pilgrims Accommodation Building was actually that first piece of modern Hajj infrastructure where, um, the, uh, the, the national economy uh, you know, is, uh, is booming. We've discovered oil. We are working with um, Western uh, contractors and consultants, and you know they came up with the idea that you know pilgrims should be sort of swiftly handled uh, from their arrival to Jeddah, taken to Mecca, back, and then off to their respective countries. So I think that that was that critical moment in history where really the, that interaction between the pilgrim and the city changes. And I hope that with this installation, we can sort of capture a moment where um, that was still in the, in the transitional phase. So the, the building actually, which you see on the complex of buildings, it's right next to Shara al-Sittin. It's close to, Al it's a five minute drive to Al-Balad. So it wasn't detached completely from the urban fabric. Um, and I think that um, when I speak with uh, the older generation, they would also tell me stories of how, how the, 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 the sidewalks were filled with markets, the pilgrims would actually in, go to the old city, come back, they would stay for a few days. So, I, and when you reflect on how the pilgrim interacts with Jeddah now, they can fly into the airport, take the train to Mecca, back to the airport and leave. And I think that there is something very valuable about that kind of just very banal interaction between the pilgrim and the city. And that's something that we need to remind ourselves that this is, you know, Jeddah was, is called the gateway to the Bawabat uh, al-Haramir, or the gateway to the holy mosques, because people had, pilgrims had to stop here before uh, leaving. And uh, we really need to start encouraging that kind of culture of how can we get how can we get the benefits of that um, and how can we maintain that lineage um yesterday we had our first group of people who are coming for umrah stop at the biennale so as i said i think there is some work being done on the cultural front inshallah but absolutely important to remember and honor this place as the gateway to the haramein uh, have you been to Al Balad recently? I would imagine you have. With what they're doing with preserving the old buildings and, and ensuring, you know, the safety of the structure, uh, what what do you think that does for 
uh, you know, almost bringing life back into Al Balad. Uh, because for many years it was maybe, you know, perhaps neglected. And now you just see so much work that Ministry of Culture and other people are, are putting into it. How does it make you feel when such importance is being given to one of the, you know, the, 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 one of the nicest places of our city? Um, I, think it's, I think it's great what's happening in Al Balad. Um, I think there's still a lot more uh, that needs to be done, especially to the modern buildings that reside there, uh, because there is this split that I think is, is not just nationwide, it's more of a global movement. We were in a symposium in, uh, in Berlin a few months ago, and you see this kind of split between traditional and modern um, in Morocco, in Egypt, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Palestine, you see that everywhere. So I think it's, it's part of our responsibility to kind of raise awareness on that as, as a collective um, on, on a global scale. Um, but I also think that more attention should be given to the peripheries of Al Balad. Um, and I believe that's, that's coming soon, part of their uh, wider master plan. I mean, for me, one of the most interesting experiences was actually um, Balad Beast, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it did bring the area to life in a very informal manner, because now there's a huge focus on what is traditional. But then you see this very contemporary event happening people having fun, people letting loose, people in their shorts. I'd go there in shorts and I always felt weird. But this day was just like, everyone was in shorts, everyone was happy, everyone was interacting naturally with the village. You're not just going to photograph the buildings and leave or to go have that one great coffee place or that one great fish place uh, and leave. But it's, it's, it's not, for that specific moment in time, it wasn't a destination but it was a place for you to stay for hours on end and um, show different means of expression through music, food, um, going into in and out of the houses, the VIB houses or whatever they were called. I think it's really, really interesting and to see more of these initiatives spread out across different cities is something that we deeply need and I'm pretty sure that that's down the pipeline happening somewhere. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll open the question for the floor for anyone who has questions for these three lovely, very knowledgeable people. Did I see a hand there? No? But we have a brave person in the second row. I think it's a uh, very interesting question um, because I think that the, the same consultants who designed the, uh, the, the Air Pilgrim's accommodation also designed the quarantine key, um, which is the iconic Bab al Bunt, maybe people would, be, would, would know that. So it was that, you know, you know the old images of Jeddah with the arched uh, pier. I don't know if you've seen those. Um, so it is very interesting because it was, um, I think that the, uh, the process definitely had to do with quarantine uh, because there were quarantine facilities that were being built simultaneously at the same time. And I think it was also, um, I mean, when, uh, when, I'm, when I read um, you know, the history of these buildings through um, the writings of Abdel Quddus al-Ansari, he's like one of Jeddah's famous historians, um, and it was, uh, <coughs> it was basically King Abdul Aziz's gift to 
the, the community to say that, okay, you know, we're going to um, alleviate the congestion that happens with the Hajj and the outbreaks that uh, were happening, um, you know, in the decades before. So these pilgrim accommodations would generate income um, affordable to the pilgrims, but they would also generate income and they would, uh, you know, keep the city uh, free for, you know, commerce and, and trade. And pilgrims would, you know, come in and they, would st they used to actually stay. And there were three accommodation buildings. So there was one for the sea, one for the Sudanese or African pilgrims, and one for the air pilgrims. So it was kind of a network of accommodations that uh, moved, uh, moved the pilgrims um, beyond that quarantine uh, island phase into uh, and bring them back into the city and making sure that they that they mix uh, that they are uh, <coughs> that they come in and leave to Mecca um, right after. Um, hi. Uh, I'm going to ask a question as an outsider. I'm not, I'm not an architect. I don't know much about architecture. But uh, something that you guys were talking about was archiving and documenting for a lot of the old buildings. So I just want to see if you guys can elaborate. What does that mean, essentially? Uh, that's it. Uh, so, I mean, the doc for us, documenting and archiving is a... It's an interesting process um, because there's so, when we first started, we thought, okay, you know, you take pictures of the building, uh, you dig up old, um, you dig up old plans or old drawings of the building. But we, uh, went, once we started to work on that, we realized that the process is much wider and much bigger. What do you document? And um, so there, there's the outward physical form that you can take pictures of, um, do make 3D models out of find drawings, uh, original drawings by the architect or the contractor. But then there's also another process where you start to collect the stories and how the building was inhabited over time, uh, which becomes much more interesting because it sort of takes that, because I think when you talk about archiving, you're essentially saying I'm taking something and sort of freezing it in time and this is, this is what it is, this is its totality. Uh, and for us, the process is actually, you know, um, much wider than that because w the way we appreciate that specific period of time is linking it to a lot wider continuity so um, when you look at the stories of the people and how they use the building and what kind of communities um, were um, were utilizing the, the, the space you start to understand reflect back and understand how we are um, using spaces and how we are um, <coughs> how we are attached to objects and places ourselves today. So it becomes part of a longer conversation and it kind of shifts the, the conv it shifts the focus from history for history's sake or to history for how we can move forward in the future. And I think that that's the more interesting part. <coughs> Just to kind of wrap it up for you, <coughs> we used to teach at the university, Kavdarezi mm -hmm. University, and whenever we kind of uh, create a project or create a brief for our students, they would generally just look at London or Amsterdam or different parts of the world. And I think that was kind of one of the factors that made us almost subconsciously start noticing that is that there is no archival material. They can't go back to anything. So you, you need to search for these things, but I mean, you can't Google everything, you know what I mean? So if there is, and that's what we aspire to do, and I think the Architecture and Design Commission is also doing that part of the Ministry of Culture, is to have a centralized archival, archival sort of system, whether it be it a website, a library, or what have you. Um, so it's, it's interesting, and it's not only for us, but you have external consultants come in. How do they get to know about Jeddah, Riyadh, Khobar, uh, Mecca, Medina, any of these areas, if they don't have a direct access to that? I mean, um, myself, I've studied in Bristol, Turkey studied in Montreal, uh, and I think it was very easy to access different things. You just go on a website and you can kind of even just scroll through the timeline and see how the city has shifted. You can pick different buildings, get plans. 
So that's, that's the aspiration, and it's, it's, it's archiving everything. So even for us, it's archiving 90s buildings, the ones that are covered in the super ugly, Aduku Bond panels, um, I think is still part of that archive, and that's what I meant in the beginning, that we're not selective about it. It's archiving this building, archiving this moment. Everything uh, that's happening needs to be archived in some sort of way, because at this time, moment in time, there is this lack, but I think the conscious, the collective consciousness is becoming bigger and bigger and everyone is feeding into this pool. I think um, there's also a broader question here about the ways that we archive. And when we look at regions like this or regions where I'm from even in South Africa, we wonder why there are no archives for our histories or why the archives around our histories are slanted um, in, in a particular way, a Western-facing gaze. Um, and of course, it's incredibly important that we do learn how to document and preserve our buildings, our stories through writing, through photography, that you know, we, we, we have accurate documentation, so to speak, of, of what these places are. But uh, I think if we think about what it is to be a Muslim, there's so much in our lives that's passed down orally, that's passed down orally, that's passed down through how things are taught and spoken. Um, if we think about the silsila or the hadith as well, there's, there's always a chain where we can trace back how far something goes through stories and through the character of a person and of a human being. This extends to so much. It extends to the way that craft is passed down from generation to generation. We really come from heritages and traditions that are lived and living. And so many of the installations in the Biennale, in the, in the Qibla section, uh, do, do that through the way that the artists have collaborated with craftspeople or how they've worked to embody um, aspects of archive that they're manifesting then as contemporary lived experiences. And in the outdoor works, we're also encouraging a kind of living archive by allowing the installations to have a life beyond themselves. So in Brick Lab's work, for example, not only are they reflecting on stories and histories, they've actively worked on documenting stories with people in Jeddah. And th these are stories that are disappearing that we're not going to have for much longer. But also as a lived and as a living project, they're collaborating with traders in Jeddah who will activate the space from time to time. We're going to have meals outside the installation. So really thinking about the archive as a place that's active. And that's a place for all of us to engage with and to live and breathe with as well. Well, let's hear your voice properly. <laughs> Maybe everyone can hear me. It's a small room. Um, uh, two, two, two points, one on the archive issue, because the archive is not necessarily neutral. Any archival process is not neutral. So it's always done with a particular point of view, and somehow it becomes discursive. And we have to be very, part very careful about uh, why are we specifically selecting or bracketing this particular, these particular selections of elements to represent a point in time. So that's something that we need to be careful about because it, it does s suggest an exclusion as much as it is archival. So that's, so, so, so maybe there is, there needs to be multiplicities of archival processes to allow for a full representation of a particular era in, its all, in, a, in all its dimensions. Then we can have a proper holistic picture and, and then we can have a proper critical reflection on who we are at a particular moment in time, uh, taking into consideration these multiplicities of representations and productions. Uh, so that's just, let's put that aside. I'm more interested in the first thing that between you and Dasma. Uh, and and uh, between between Rick Lab and, and Basma and maybe and maybe uh, Sumaya as well is the because today we, we, we there are so much there's so much work happening in Al Balad new master plans are being drawn every day 
I was like, every month I see a new master plan, every, every month I see a new potential connection. Now they're talking about the connection to the Hussam Palace. Uh, so there's a political reality that is interjected into, into the historical sort of center of Jeddah. Then, of, of course, there's the water. And what, what happened in terms, like you go to Jeddah, you don't even smell the sea anymore. But so you need to recreate that, that ecological scape essentially, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I honestly didn't know that there was a quarantine island. And there is another story that you guys were just sort of uh, talking about. And I was wondering, is there a place for that story in the new master plans that are being drawn? So. I, I, maybe because they're thinking still. I, I think my previous response about the archive is absolutely suggesting and agreeing that the archive is not neutral and that there is a necessity for different forms of archive. Archives that are contained in the body, that are contained in materiality, contained in how we tell stories and how we remember. And so many of the works, Basma and Studio Bound's work as well, is really thinking about documenting the small histories that have largely been forgotten or that we aren't perhaps aware of because they fall out of the macro narrative. The same for Brick Lab's work. And I think there's also something to be said for constructing archives that are beyond the dominant gazes that we have for archiving, where they exist in archives that are filmic, oral, subjective, coming from stories and rumors, um, you know, thinking about documenting things that wouldn't necessarily be documented in Basma and Studio Bound's instance, the pattern of the prayer carpets of these small mosques as well. So I think we're all very much in agreement with you about the project of the archive being multifarious and, and, and the need for it to, to really be plural. Um, I also think that all of us are advocating for these stories to be remembered um, and because the, the pace of change is so rapid, we're also asking for moments to reflect on recent history and we're thinking about how we make that a part of the future that's currently being developed and, and incubated here. And I, I know that I'm speaking for Studio Bound and Brick Lab, at least, when I, when I think about the projects that they worked on in the Biennale. Yeah, and I think there is definitely, that's at least something in our practice, and, and you already know this, that we always try to infuse different projects with these kind of unrealized moments in time or unrealized stories. And I think that's what we're trying to do here, and that's what we constantly try to do in our projects, we always kind of challenge the brief and say, okay, you're looking at Al Balad here, but what about what happened on the other side that was somehow connected back there? Um, and I think it's the more we keep pushing, the more we keep challenging, at some point it is gonna become, as, as a collective effort, all of us together, I think that's where it's gonna become prominent in the architectural language at least, and maybe even the urban language of the city. I hope so. <laughs> I just wanted to also um, say something I, on behalf of the Diria Biennale Foundation, if I may. A big part of the platform that's being offered here is that it is an opportunity to create discourse around the very things that we're talking about uh, in the contemporary perspective and in the historic perspective as well. So there are several objects and artifacts that are now legacy projects of this Biennale. There is a mihrab that was recently rescued from a part of the airport that was being demolished. It's now become a research project for the Biennale. Um, there are several others. The Kaaba column as well is currently being carbon dated. Um, and the, the Biennale Foundation is now undertaking a research project to conserve it. So as much as it is important to think about our deep history, I think platforms like this allow us to think about both simultaneously, our, our deep history and our present history as well. That brings us to eight o'clock on the dot. Um, I want to thank, so I know time flies when you're having fun, uh, Sumeya Abdurrahman and Turki for uh, a very enlightening conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it, and um, we look forward to seeing you guys around uh, in one of our future talks. Thank you all for attending.